The House committee investigating the January 6th attack on the Capitol is apparently working right up until the end of 2022 and is still surprising us. Today, former Trump White House aide Kellyanne Conway appeared at the Capitol. She apparently met with committee investigators for almost five hours. She hadn't, as far as we know, talked to the committee before this. It's expected the committee will issue a final report before the end of the year with one last televised January 6th hearing before the new Republican Congress is sworn in in January and the Jan 6 committee is shut down. In the Senate, however, the work of maintaining American democracy will continue. One of the people who is doing that work is Senator Amy Klobuchar, Democrat of Minnesota and member of the Judiciary Committee. And she joins me now. Um, Senator, Thanks, I'd, like, I'd like you to articulate how you view the Senate's role and the Senate Democratic majority's role in sort of providing a bulwark to American democracy against the forces that would seek to upend it now that the, the Republicans are going to take the House and that, and that will be uh, in, in Republican control in this next Congress. Exactly. And I would love to know what Kellyanne Conway told the investigators. I hope we will find out. Um, and I thank the January 6th committee for their incredible work. Now, over in the Senate, because we kept the Senate and we want to add that one more seat, I loved all the people turning out to vote in Georgia. Um, that means that, one, we can confirm judges and continue confirming judges. You know the role that they have played in rejecting election deniers and other claims throughout the system. That's number one. Number two, we want to get the Electoral Count Act, a bipartisan product in the Senate. I'm the chair of the Rules Committee, and we're working to get that through before the end of the year. Number three, the efforts that you just saw in Georgia, where Democrats pushed to allow for, of course, Saturday voting, continuing to push voting rights in every state capital and also on the federal level. Not as easy, but we must continue the cause, protecting election workers, uh, making sure that they have the resources that they need. All of this will be going on in the Senate. Um, and we will, of course, allow the special counsel that was just appointed to be able to do his job with the important investigation uh, going on over in the Justice Department. You just mentioned how much the courts have been a locus of all this, and in, in, in different ways. I think the courts have uh, withstood assaults on, you know, flagrant attempts to, uh, to overturn elections, particularly in 2020. However, some of the Supreme Court's jurisprudence on things like partisan gerrymandering and the Voting Rights Act have been incredibly troubling and have aided and abetted, I think, some of the anti-democratic forces. You have an amicus brief in a case the court's going to hear Moore versus Harper, I believe, next week, uh, which sets up this uh, the notion that basically the state legislature is the only authority under the Constitution who gets to decide rules about the election, a view that's, I think, roundly rejected by almost everyone except for some extremists, but now is before the court. This is an unbelievable case that a lot of your viewers may not have heard about. This is the North Carolina legislature conducting an unconstitutional power grab. They basically put forward a gerrymandered map their Supreme Court, state Supreme Court, rejected it, and they said, you know what? We don't need you. We don't care about the balance of power. We're going right up to the Supreme Court and saying, you cannot review what we do. So here's the interesting thing here, Chris. Not only did 19 of my incredible colleagues join me on this amicus brief that we filed, there's another brief by the Conference of Chief Judges Justices, state Supreme Court justices from liberal to very conservative, yep. in a rare moment, joined together, filed a brief that says what we said, that you have to have checks and balances. There must be state court review. So this argument before the Supreme Court is going to be very important, and it is not exactly as it appears. You've got people like Stephen Calabrese, one of the founders of the conservative judicial movement, on our side on this. You have got a number of lawyers like Ben Ginsburg, a major lawyer for the Republican Party, on our side on this. You simply can't say, as the North Carolina legislature did, guess what, we're not going to be reviewed for anything we do. If the Supreme Court does not side with this very broad coalition of people saying you must have that balance of power. We could have extreme outcomes, Chris, in terms of what state legislatures could do going forward. Well, you also got this kind of anti-democratic flywheel that starts to 
to happen where, you know, because um, the state legislatures can kind of gerrymander themselves into power, then they can kind of barricade <laughs> themselves inside a gerrymander. And then if they're the ultimate final say, they get to steamroll the state Supreme Court, you end up in a little bit of this place where there's this like bizarre supremacy that's clicked into place where you can't really like dislodge them. You can't get out of it. You're stuck forever in this vortex. And that is why we have a balance of powers. That's why we have governors with veto powers, whether we like it or not. Uh, that is why we have yep. a president and a court and a, a congressional uh, group of people here in the House and Senate that make decisions. It's not pretty. We know that. But the balance of powers has always been very important. That's why this case is the one case that no one's ever heard of uh, that could make history either way. It could make history where we finally see some of these justices say, I'm going to do the right thing here and allow for the continuation of the balance of power, which is supported by every single state Supreme Court chief justice in the country, or I'm going to go way astray with these extremists, and there will be no end to what could go on with gerrymandered maps. Quickly, in the final 45 seconds, here's some news I wanted to get your reaction to. The president putting out a statement today saying he's urging Congress to pass legislation to essentially uh, impose a labor agreement between the big railroad unions and the railroad companies. This is an agreement that the unions have dissented from, uh, but Congress has the power to basically override the union's dissent and force this agreement on them. Uh, do, would you support such legislation? Well, I certainly support um, resolving this strike. And one way that this can happen, a potential strike, I should say, is by Congress getting involved. And that's why they're bringing it to us, because—and, by the way, I think they continue to negotiate. One of the things that's concerning to me here, and I talked to some of my colleagues today, is this idea of sick leave, that they don't have— uh, any sick leave under this agreement. And that's why some of the unions, not all of them, I will be clear, yep. some of the unions objected to this. And that's what we're going to consider now going forward, unless there is a way to reach an agreement. And I know the president and the labor secretary, Marty Walsh, are doing everything they can and Pete Buttigieg to resolve this. But clearly on the table will be congressional intervention.